Good evening and welcome back for our evening services. I uh, don't know if we have any visitors, but if we do, we're always glad that we have visitors. Let's go to Heavenly Father in prayer at this time. Dear God, we're so thankful that we have you as our God, the great I am. Thank you, Father, for your grace. Thank you for your mercy upon us, for all the blessings that you give us each and every day. We th we're thankful for that. Father, be with us as we walk in this world that we might be a shining light for those that need to respond to the gospel. Be with those that have been mentioned that are uh, sick, those that are going in for treatments. Uh, we ask your tender kindness upon them, comfort them, and bring them back to this family of Christ that awaits them here. Be with us as we sing songs of praise unto you, our God. And Father, we're so thankful for those that are assembled here this morning to study your word that we can be better servants in your kingdom. And this we pray in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Our first song this evening will be number 684. 684 and after this song we'll have our opening prayer. This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel it. Shall we pray? Most righteous and ever-loving Heavenly Father, we do humble ourselves here this evening, realizing and knowing you're the one and only true and living God. And Father, we're so thankful for every blessing of life that you so bountifully bestow upon each and every one of us. The most precious gift of all, Heavenly Father, allowing your Son to come to this earth 
walk upon this earth for approximately 33 years or so and gave his life upon that cross to wipe away the sins of mankind so that each and every one of us would have the opportunity of forgiveness of sins and eternal life. And Father, we're so thankful for this local congregation. We're thankful for each and every member that attends here. We pray that you'll watch over each and every one of them and keep them all safe and free from harm. Help each and every one of us, Father, to develop the talents that we have, to let our light shine for you here locally so this congregation can grow and abound and continue in the truth. Father, we're so thankful for the elders that we have and they keep us on a straight and narrow path. We don't lean to the left or the right. We go straight down the line, Heavenly Father, and we're thankful for their dedication and all the hours and time that they spent or spend worshiping or you, Heavenly Father, and making sure that each and every one of us in this local congregation stays true to your word. Father, we're thankful for the deacons that we have and the work that they do, and we're thankful, Father, for our local minister and his ability to proclaim thy word. And most especially, Father, we're thankful for all those people that teach in our Bible school classes and the dedication they have for teaching the youth to understand your word, stand firm in your word. And Father, we know that we have a lot of this local congregation that have health issues. It is our prayer, Father, that you will bring them all back to their much wanted and, and needed health. And we ask you, Father, to be with all the Christians across this world and realizing many of them live in places that aren't safe. We ask you to watch over them, keep them all safe and free from harm. We ask you to be with this great country that we live in and we know, Father, right now there's a COVID epidemic that's across this nation and, and many people have been diagnosed with it. And uh, We ask you, Father, to be with all those first responders and those doctors and nurses that take care of those people and help them to, to do the things that will help each and every one of them get better and get well. And Father, we ask you to be with those in this world that have never heard your word proclaimed. It is our prayer that before they die and leave this world, Heavenly Father, that they'll have an opportunity to hear the truth proclaimed to them. And it'll spark an interest in them and they'll want to know what more about you and we as Christians can assist them and studying your word and, and becoming Christians. And Father, for those that know you, but have fallen away from you, it's our prayer, Father, that they'll realize the error of their ways, repent of their sins, and, and turn back to you. We ask you, Father, now that each and every one of us will be attentive to if Brother Lindell brings his message to us, that those things will help us become stronger, they'll help us become better. Christians, Father. We ask you now to guide us in our service. We ask you to forgive us of our sins and keep all, all of us safe and free from harm. For this is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Number 583. 583. Sing to me of heaven, sing that song of peace from the
If you would like to mark our song of encouragement, it will be number 270, number 270. And before Brother Mitchell comes and brings a lesson from God's Word, we'll sing number 602, 602. Thank you all for being here this evening. I appreciate your presence. It's encouragement to all the other brethren, and it's certainly encouragement to me to see people that are interested in spiritual matters. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 15 through 18, Brother Peter writes these words. Make sure that none of you suffers as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or a troublesome meddler, the New, King, uh, New American Standard says. The King James Bible says it's a busybody in other people's matters. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, he is not to be ashamed, but to glorify God in this name. For it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the outcome of those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is with difficulty that the righteous is saved, what will, be, what will become of the godless man and the sinner? Of course, that's a rhetorical question. You know what will become of them. And so I want to back up to the front of that, though, when he tells us how not to suffer. And one of them is to be a meddlesome person. I've just noticed, and you can correct me if you haven't had that same experience, but a lot of times in local congregations, and I know across the brotherhood, there are a lot, a lot of uh, opportunities for people to scare up a fuss when they're in one. There can be peace and harmony going on, and uh, there's a couple personalities I could name for you. If you get them on scene for very long, it won't be peaceful long. And, and so there are a lot of unnecessary struggles that go on. There are things that are worth fighting for. There are things that require uh, correction, 
And, but not everything sometimes that people get involved in um, is one of those things. And that brings me to the topic for this evening, self-governed, which has to do with autonomy. Autonomy is kind of a strange word in some ways, and so I wanted to make sure uh, that my mind was freshened on that, and I went back and looked at the Collegiate Dictionary, and it said it means the quality or state of being self-governing, especially the right to self-government, self-directing freedom, and especially moral independence. Well, I'll mind mine, you mind yours. I'll take care of mine, you take care of yours. That's kind of what autonomy has to do with. And some say the church is autonomous, but that needs further explanation, I think. And I want to do that this evening with you. Review some matters that for some of you are, I know, things you've known for a long, long time. But it's something that we, that we need to recognize and stress again and again. It's one of the almost unique characteristics of the Church of Christ. There are some independently autonomous congregations out there. They're not affiliated with us. Uh, but our brethren are almost unique in that. The Bible speaks of the church, the great indivisible body, the church in the aggregate to which God adds all baptized believers. In Matthew 16 and 18, he says, I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. And in Acts chapter 2 and verse 47, Luke writes, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord was adding to the church daily such as should be saved. And so you have these uh, self-governing congregations. This one body is the universal church, the saved throughout the world and, in, and of every generation. It's talked about in that way sometimes. And the headquarters of the universal church is in heaven. And people who find themselves affiliated with a religious organization that's headquartered somewhere on this planet, I would have to say as kindly as I know how, you're in the wrong pew. That's, that's a mistake, and it's a serious mistake. Uh, it is an imperishable kingdom that the Lord established, and Jesus is the only king of that kingdom. He is the high holy potentate. In 1 Timothy 6, verse 13, beginning, Paul says, I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and to Christ Jesus who testified the good confession before Pontius Pilate that you keep the commandment without stain or reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will bring about at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign King of kings and Lord of lords. And so the, the kingdom's constitution, its, its governing document, is the Bible. And there are no provisions anywhere authorizing anyone or any group of persons to amend that document, to modify that document in any way. It is the divine rule, and it is immutable. In Revelation chapter 22, as John is closing out that work in verses 18 and 19, he says, I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues which are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his part from the tree of life and from the holy city which are written in this book. Paul emphasized the immutability of the words of God produced by men carried along by the Holy Spirit in Galatians chapter 1, where he said in verse 8 beginning, but if even we, that is we, the apost uh, apostolic band, if we are an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. And as we said before, so say I now again, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, he is to be accursed. No man, no man anywhere, no gathering of men, no matter what their credentials are, what their status is in society, nobody anywhere has divine authorization to modify the God-breathed words of our Lord. 
Uh, Paul writes in 2 Timothy 3 and verse 16, you've heard me say it many times, but the, the phrase in Greek is very powerful. Pasographe theopneustos. All writings, God breathed. That's, they are from God. Now one may change it. And if he changes it, he is cursed by God. And at that point, it's without hope unless he repents. It is obvious that there is no autonomy in the heavenly kingdom. I'm going to turn this on tonight. I forgot to this morning. I'm probably going to do, present the lesson anyway, but I'll, I'll turn it on to make, keep me on track. There is no autonomy in the heavenly aspect of the heavenly phase, if you will, of the kingdom. There, you know, the Lord has his kingdom in heaven and he's got us here on the earth. We're part of, we're citizens of the kingdom. But there's no autonomy there because he's king of kings and lord of lords. And there's not really autonomy here in the absolute sense since he rules through his powerful word. And we are, we, the, the word, uh, uh, his word called uh, creation to be. That's how powerful his word is. His word sustains the creation as it is. And so we, do, we follow that word but we are able to follow it according to the dictates of our own conscience within our own local congregation. The Bible decrees the saved of the earth, the universal church are to be organized into local congregations of his people. Uh, you can have a number of congregations in and around a community. When we preached in, in uh, McNary County, Tennessee, there were 17 congregations of the Lord's people all in perfect harmonious fellowship with one another, nobody fighting about anything. But every little community in that county had a congregation. And most of them were at least 75 or 80, and some of them were, of course, larger than that in the bigger towns. But all independent of one another in terms of their day-to-day -day operations. The Bible decrees that we are to be gathered in local congregations. The superintendents of the local church are said to be elders. They're also called under shepherds. They're called uh, pastors. They're called bishops. Each of those terms refers to or emphasizes a different aspect of the work that they do. Elders are, in matters of expediency, the rulers of the local congregation. Hebrews 13 and verse 17 says, obey your leaders. Submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. So Christians are to select men to be elders, and those elders are to be appointed by the evangelist. That's something we, in a lot of places, you don't see ever happen. But in Titus 1 and verse 5, Brother Paul writes to Titus, and he says, uh, For this cause I left you in Crete that you would set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. And so he had a, a commission to help them get things in place and then to set those men in office. A distinction is to be made between selection uh, and appointment. Acts chapter 6 and verse 3, uh, you see a, a case that therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this or appoint over this, the apostle said. And so you have them selected by the brethren. They're appointed, in that case, the men were going to be appointed by the apostles. In John 15 and verse 16, he said, you didn't choose me, I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give you. You didn't choose me, I chose you and appointed you. So there's a distinction between choosing and appointing. The church selects, the preacher appoints, the elders rule. Deacons assist the elders, but the deacon has no authority beyond what is delegated to him by his shepherds. Nowhere in the new covenant are the deacons said to rule, whereas elders are told to tend the flock, and to supervise the work of the local church. Of course, elders have no authority to modify or change the divine revelation. We're not talking about that. We're talking about matters of judgment, matters of expediency. Uh, there has to be somebody somewhere that 
call shots and makes decisions. Well, God settled that. He said that those are to be elders that meet certain qualifications that are found in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1. You can read them. And uh, uh, they actually, those qualifications, with the exception of the, of the need to be a married man with children, those characteristics ought to characterize every Christian gentleman, every man. They are not to lord it over the charge given to them. They are to be strong and to tend the flock. First Peter 5, 2 and 3 says, Shepherd the flock of God among you, uh, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God, and not for sordid gain, but with eagerness, nor yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge, but provide, uh, proving to be examples to the flock. Recognizing that you have an, a volunteer organization, it's important to know, too, that you cannot lead people where they're not willing to go, that you're going to have to gain uh, their buy-in. You're going to have to sell it, if you will use a commercial term, you're going to have to sell it uh, before you get uh, buy-in, because otherwise, you'll be like that fellow running along somewhere, and a group goes by, and sometime later, he comes running up and says, you see a bunch of people go by here, I'm their leader. Well, no, you're not. You're not leading at that point. And so you have to take that all into consideration. Elders who meet the biblical standard are going to be considerate and firm at the same time. An elder has authority over the local congregation that selected him. And that's important. And that's important to understand because I've known of a few cases where you had uh, some elderships be self-appointed and trying to police the brotherhood. And that's not right. You have a need sometimes, we have a need if somebody is, is mistaken on something to point out the mistake and to call for correction, that's one thing. It's one thing to, to talk about, to study, to try to come to a better understanding of the truth. But to go from that to start trying to manage other people's choices in other communities is not within the uh, bailiwick of any of us. You know, I had a fellow one time, or know of a brother one time. I guess he's still living. He's a hot-headed character. And I love him, but he's a hothead. Congregation, he, he got the brethren all rolled up, and they were trying to tell some congregation in North Texas how to run their business. I said, well, what if they don't do it? Well, we're going to discipline them, he said. I said, how are you going to do this? We're going to write a letter. You're going to write a letter. And, that, and that's going to do what? Other than irritate the folks who you shouldn't be in their business, what's that going to do? So he was going to, it's going to stir up something where nothing existed before. I think it was a bad policy. There's no authority for that. There is no authority any elder has over a distant church or even a congregation across town. The elders here have no authority over north side or west side. No, it's north side. Over north side and no authority over the congregation um, out east. Um, Oak Grove, thank you, brother. No authority there. That doesn't mean we can't be concerned about uh, them, and we are concerned about them. I'm just saying there's no provision in the New Testament for an ecclesiastical hierarchy, as you see in the Roman Catholic Church or the Methodist Church or the Presbyterian Church. Our friends in the Pentecostal Church have a regional headquarters up here at Lufkin, so I would assume they got a state headquarters somewhere and a national headquarters somewhere. And I'm just pointing out that you can't find that in the Bible. Most religious organizations are ordered that way. That's a secular kind of arrangement. Whenever one congregation undertakes to force another congregation to submit to its will, it's crossed the line. Each local congregation is autonomous in the sense of deciding its own affairs in all matters not appointed to them in the Bible. No one is granted coercive power. Nobody has a police power to compel submission to their edicts or dictates. Congregational independence is the Lord's powerful, powerful safeguard against apostasy. The Church of Christ has no hierarchical structure. There is no earthly government above local assemblies, none anywhere. No machinery is provided in the New Testament by which uh, the universal church can be activated, corrected, punished, or coerced. 
There's just, there's not an apparatus for that. There's no apparatus outside the local church to control the activities of local congregations. Bible churches have a divinely approved government. Paul began his letter to the Philippians with these words. Philippians 1 verse 1. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus to all the saints in Christ Jesus that are at Philippi with bishops and deacons. We would probably, we normally say elders. Same office. Local bishops over each congregation. That's further shown in a statement from Paul to Titus that was just read. Titus 1 verse 5. For this reason I left you in Crete to set things in order and ordain or appoint elders in every congregation. So instead of a pyramid structure like the denominational bodies have, Christ church is organized horizontally, if you will. All the congregations, nobody over anybody else, all equal one to the other. Congregations work side by side, but they're independent of one another. Uh, they may cooperate with each other. They may assist each other. They may encourage one another. But no congregation has the right to control or dominate any other congregation of the Lord's people. The church, the good church up at Knott, Texas, has been involved with the congregation here for a number of years. We help support some brethren preaching the gospel down in Mexico. We have for years. Well, Knott also is part of that. And uh, they send a contribution to support those preachers, and the congregation here handles that administratively. They don't try to tell us what to do. We don't try to tell them what to do. We're just working together to evangelize in the great country of Mexico. And so we don't have a, a pyramid-type structure. No congregation has a right to dominate or control another. God's wisdom in using locally the locally autonomous form of church government is apparent right on the surface. Um, any astute observer, mildly astute observer, could see that. With the hierarchical structure, it is possible by corrupting the head to contaminate the whole. You can't do that with locally autonomous congregations. If the elders of a local congregation become contaminated and the congregation lets them get, get by with it, well, then it constitutes a loss of only one congregation. Every church choosing to stand in the path of right is unaffected by their digression. It doesn't har harm them in any way. God's chosen organizational structure of his church ensured that it could not be swept into error. That is, the universal church could not be swept into error by uh, or in a single stroke. You know, where you get the head guy, decides, okay, this is where we're going to go now, and he's given his ip ipsy dixit, and that's the way it's got to be. We're not set up that way. God ordained these institutions first, the home and the church. The home, like the church, is autonomous. Each individual family is independent under God, independent from every other family. The father, the mother, and the children, that's what makes up a family, a male head, Mother is his support and rock, and children make up a distinct, independent unit. The father's the head of his own family, not of a cluster of families, not of the family across the street, not of the, of the family down at the end of the cul-de-sac, or a number of families, or all the families in the county or the state. As father of his children, born into or do adopted into his family, he may instruct and discipline those children. But you start going down the street trying to discipline the neighbor's child and you're going to run into a buzzsaw. Why? Because you got in something that wasn't any of your business. You don't have authority to do that. A man has no authority to correct your children or the children in the community. God's plan for each local congregation is Christ is the head of the church. He rules his church by means of or through the Holy Scriptures. The elders are Christ under shepherds, operating under the Bible, thereby bringing themselves under the headship of Christ. Deacons assist the elders along with evangelists and teachers. This is, that is the complete formal organizational structure of the New Testament church. 
And you can search the pages of Scripture. You can go from cover to cover in, from, in the New Testament, and you're not going to find anything beyond that. And thus, that's the way God wanted it, or he'd have done it some other way. And this needs to be respected. The church of Christ is not hierarchical. Scripture makes no provision for a hierarchy. No administrative machinery exists for self-appointed counsel to rule over the churches of Christ. Every once in a while, somebody gets a burr under a saddle about something, and there are people that write things that are very helpful, that are of corrective in nature. But there, there are a lot that, that get out there, and, and they have, it seems to me, a quite a sense of their own importance and begin to speak where no man has a right to speak. What would a would-be church tyrant do? Well, if you would allow it, if we would allow that, uh, allow him to establish his own organization, begin to call the shots, he'd take us all the way into apostasy. It's happened lots of times before. In exercising her autonomy, each local congregation may determine which, if any other congregation in the larger brotherhood, that they will work with, approve of, cooperate with. They make their own choices about that. But it has no police power to compel compliance or impose sanction on somebody with whom we might disagree. Uh, for any man or any group of men outside the local church to attempt to exert, low, uh, exert control over the affairs of a sister congregation is a violation or an infringement of the divine rule and must be resisted or better yet ignored. There are blessings that attend to us on the basis of our being autonomous. You see, why would the Lord design his church so that local congregations would be autonomous? Why, why we don't claim to know all the reasons, there are some that stand out very obviously. Self-evident blessings are easily seen in God's arrangement for the governance of his church. Autonomy helps isolate and stop the spread of error. You know, whenever somebody has a highly communicable disease in the hospital, they will put a sign on the door. And you can't just go waltzing in there. You got to suit up. You got to put on gloves. You got to put on the mask. You got to, when you come out, you take it off under the supervision of a nurse. You wash your hands. What are they trying to do? They're trying to isolate that particular organism at that place so that it doesn't get out into the wider community. And so by having churches be autonomous, you have isolated or do have the opportunity to stop and or, and or isolate the spread of error. Paul warned Christians in Corinth in 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 6 when he said, your boasting is not good. Do you know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough? Now he's talking in that context about a local church and about the negative influence that sin is going to have within that local congregation. We know sin and its attendant errors are progressive, like cancer. In 2 Timothy 3.13, he says, But evil men and imposters will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. We also know that sin can infect a congregation from without or within. In Acts 20, Verses 29 and 30, Brother Paul is there speaking with the elders over at Ephesus. Paul, as far as we know, preached there, and the, it was the longest stretch of anywhere during his many journeys. Uh, can't prove that, but he was there three years, he says he was, and that's the longest named one. And he says to these elders, I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. That's from outside. Savage wolves will come in. And from among your own selves, that's inside, from among your own selves, men will arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. And so he warns them about the danger they face from within and without. Without the protection of local autonomy, these two avenues may very well merge and allow error to spread more destructively and more effectively. Autonomy serves to buffer to, to protect a local congregation from others who have gone off and have become apostate. When Jesus addressed the seven churches of Asia in Revelation chapter 2, verse uh, 2 and 3, five of them 
had problems that he said need to be corrected. But that no issue affected all of them. There are seven churches. No one issue affected all of them. They were all local problems that he was dealing with in the five that he called for correction. Autonomy allows dedicated churches to work more efficiently. There is a temptation to think that a larger program with a bigger administrative apparatus uh, in more complex administrative uh, organs is necessarily better. That's, a lot of people think that. But now, you just think with me. In this country, power has shifted steadily away from local state governments to the federal government and the bureaucracy that owns it. And programs, they hope, in shifting that power, are going to be run more efficiently, and if the authorities will do a better job, than's done on the local level. But if you've ever tried to get a federal agency on the phone, you may be disabused of that notion. Just try to get somebody on the phone. A large bureaucracy does not always assure the work will be completed in a more expeditious and a more efficient fashion. Not at all. In fact, the opposite is often true. The wise man wrote in Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and verse 8, If you see oppression of the poor and denial of justice and righteousness in the province, do not be shocked at the sight. For one official watches over another official, and there are higher officials over them. And I would, go, if I were going to add something, I would say, and they're all going to point the finger at each other. So you've got all of that up and down, and what are they going to do? Regardless of intentions, large bureaucracies have a tendency to become bloated and increasingly ineffective. Autonomous churches are not dependent upon decision. Uh, or approval of others, nor do they depend on organizations that other people have created. They, they don't have to get permission from somebody. I knew a, a gentleman in Tennessee. He was a Cumberland Presbyterian. I'm not sure exactly what distinction, what that means, but that's what they were. There was a, one in town, and there was one outside of town. He was a member of the one outside of town. And he was expressing frustration to me one time. He was a very devout man. Uh, he was expressing frustration because whenever they hired a preacher, he said the, the town church, the bigger church, the wealthier church, what they, what they said went. He didn't think that was quite fair. And, of course, I honed right in on that. It's not fair. It's not biblical either. And you, you need to be somewhere other than where you are. Uh, he, did, he stayed with it, but uh, we're not dependent here on what other organizations decide or don't decide. And that's a great blessing. Congregations only depend upon the instructions found in the pages of the New Testament. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13, he says, Retain the standard of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Retain what? The standard of sound words. That's, that's what we appeal to. Provided the work undertaken by a local church is lawful before men, brethren are free to do what they deem most expedient under God, under the scriptures. 1 Corinthians 10, 23 says, all things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful, but not all things edify. Autonomy encourages local development and local work. You know, there are, there are ways for churches to be involved in good works in other locations. I'm not, I'm not non-institutional the way brethren describe that. I'm not that. Uh, they may engage in evangelistic outreach and supporting preachers elsewhere. Uh, Second, Tim, uh, Second Cor uh, Corinthians chapter 11, at verse 8, Paul writes to them, and he says, I robbed other churches by taking wages from them to serve you. I'm, I allowed other people to support me in your community. They should uh, possibly have been ashamed of that. I don't know what the circumstances were. They may certainly send men, congregations may send men out to preach. Acts chapter 13, verse 1 starts with like this. Now they were at Antioch 
in the church that was there, prophets, teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Menaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then when they had fasted and prayed they, and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So they were sent uh, into the work at that point. They could participate. Congregations can participate together in compassion outreach and so, uh, uh, share resources with brethren who've suffered severe hardship. We do that. We've done that some through uh, the brethren, brethren that get together in Nashville and, and uh, do disaster relief. Uh, they have regional men that go around, representatives, and try to get congregations locally. They don't, they don't try to boss anybody, but you know, when Alaska was torn up, um, the brother, I think, called Don for first and said, look, we've got a truckload of material we'd like to send down and help you folks. If, if, if y'all can put somebody together to help us distribute it, We'll send it, no strings attached. They wanted a congregation. They wanted some elders involved in it. But that's on the only requirement that they had. It wasn't that they were telling anybody else what to do or that anybody else felt that kind of pressure. Local autonomy. Local church autonomy protects us against error. Local church autonomy promotes very vigorously efficiency, and it encourages local involvement. You know, sometimes the best we can do is contribute monetarily. But it's also good to have opportunities to get one's own hands dirty and to be involved personally and to see the, the, the faces of the people that are being affected by the work that we're doing. Autonomy means that no matter what other churches around us might do, we can continue to stand for the truth and continue to do the Lord's work. You know, several years ago, many years ago, in fact, whenever some of our brethren got in a row about instrumental music and the Christian church ultimately split off because they were just determined to introduce something that's not authorized in the assembly of worship, and that is play with an instrument. And Brother Lipscomb, David Lipscomb, opposed that in the Gospel Advocate. And... Um, I forgot the paper. It was probably the Christian Standard up in Cincinnati. They drew a cartoon of Brother Lipscomb wearing a dress, and he was trying to sweep the ocean back. Well, that's funny. That's real funny. It was kind of funny. But the fact remains that the Lord said to sing, and David Lipscomb was saying, we sing, you sing and play, you tell me why. And he kept pushing that because it was right. And it didn't matter to a man like David Lipscomb, it wouldn't have mattered if the whole world had gone that direction. He wasn't going to budge. Why? Because he was standing four square on the gospel of Christ. You stand on the words of God. And that's what he revered. Let us be about the business of preaching the word. Paul tells that young evangelist Timothy, preach the word. Say, not your opinions, not your doubts, not your fears. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season, Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound teaching, but they shall to themselves heap to themselves teachers having itching ears and be turned away from the truth. Resist, resist infection with radicalism. Don't ever let anybody persuade you to get on board with any kind of, of organized coup d'etat, or anything like that, you stay with your local leadership and you'll be fine. 1 Corinthians 16, verses 13 and 14, Paul writes, be on alert, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong, let all that you do be done in love. That was a good statement, wasn't it? Let all that you do, when you stand firm and strong, be done in love. It may be that there's someone here tonight who needs to reconnect with our Lord. Or it may be that you're carrying some burden that's just about to break you down. We may not know it because you get dressed up and you put on your, your happy face and you come. But if you are in that kind of distress, 
you would honor us to give us the opportunity to pray for you and with you. And you don't ever need to tell any more detail than you're comfortable with, but just know that we're always there. And of course, we're always there for anyone that would name the name of Jesus as Savior and Lord. And having come to that understanding, repent and turn of sin from sin because you recognize that that's what he requires. You can't continue to walk down that path because that is a path to torment. Don't go there. Repent and turn. Confess your faith that Jesus is the Lord because he requires that. He said, I tell you nay, but say to you, repent, you shall all likewise perish. And then he goes on to say in Matthew 10, 32, whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I also confess before my Father who is in heaven. Then he flips it and he says the next verse, whosoever therefore shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Don't experience that. Come, confess your faith and be buried with our Lord in baptism for the remission of sins. That's not my word, that's his word. That's his requirement. And just like Peter told the people on Pentecost when they asked him what they must do, I tell you, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. If we can help you do any of those things, please let us as together we're standing and singing.
Be seated, please. To help to prepare our minds for the partaking of the Lord's Supper, we'll sing number 268, number 268. This is for those that did not have an opportunity to partake of the Lord's Supper this morning to remember that sacrifice that our Lord made on the cross for our sins and that he was raised on the third day so that if we obey him that we have the opportunity to spend eternity in heaven with him. Would you pray with me please? Father, as we gather here around this table to remember our Lord's death on the cross, Father, as we partake of this bread, which represents his body that hung on that cross for us, may we all look back on that day. May we remember his love, 
his mercy, his sacrifice, his courage, Father. And may we partake in a way pleasing unto you in Christ's name. Amen. Let's pray for the cup. Father, as we continue to remember our, our Savior's death on the cross, as we pray for this fruit of the vine, which represents his blood that was shed for us, the blood that washes us white as snow, Father, may we partake in a way that's well-pleasing in your sight. In Christ's name, amen. That completes our communion service. Let us have a prayer for the offering. Father, we thank you for everything that you do for us. And Father, that includes the, the material things that we receive. At this time, Father, as we have the opportunity to give back as we purposed in our heart, we pray that we can give in a way that's pleasing to you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. I want to encourage everyone that can to be back on Wednesday night for the Bible study. And speaking of Bible study, I want to make uh, continue to stress the good work that goes on at WBBS World Video Bible School. Their entire program is uh, on the internet and it's free. And you go up to WVBS.org and, and um, check on there and you can go in and have those courses and there's um, every course they've done in about the past 30, 35 years since that work was begun, is there. There are over 3,000 people that participate in it, some for credit, some audit, some are just uh, picking uh, random things that they're interested in. One of the things that encourages me about that is that you hear from people in places like Pakistan and uh, Iran and Saudi Arabia where it is uh, those people get in trouble if they get caught listening to that. And uh, I think in some of those places, it's not even legal for them to own a Bible, but they, they have those. And, um, and so it, it's an opportunity to reach out, but you can participate in that as well. Because all those classes are in English. And I just want to keep that before you. Just check WVBS.org sometime and uh, say there's a lot of good work done by our brethren. And uh, we would, uh, you would appreciate it if you have a chance to examine some of that. Shall we be standing as we're dismissed? Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, thank you to allow us to come this first day of the week, Father, this morning and this evening to allow us to worship you and, and thank you for all the blessings that you give us. Thank you for our Lord and Jesus Christ to die on that cross to give us the chance, the everlasting life, Father. And Father, we pray who those that cannot be here for health issues and for those that goes to different treatments, Father, we ask you that you straighten them and bring them back to us. And Father, be, be with those that lost a loved one, Father, like Mona Sheets, Father, we ask that you strengthen them and, and with, for the loss that they have, Father, and, and be with all of us, Father, as we go through this life, Father. Help us to be better each and every day, Father, and thank you for the lessons that Brother Linda brought us to us and help us to apply to our daily lives. And Father, forgive us when we fail and help us to be every day the light that you want us to be, Father. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.